Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Critical Reactions with your host, Brian. We're going to finish up this week. We're going to look at our, our final unique vocal for the theme and then check out a creator request after that. Today, we're going to be looking at Hakushi Hasegawa. The song is called Neutral. Let's see what's going on here. Interesting way to start. Yeah. Ooh. Especially uh, how often they're being used. curious uh if it's all one person if they sing while playing or if uh it's uh it's a two-person thing going on where they have a, a pianist and a vocalist it doesn't change anything about the music it just makes the performance uh more impressive at least for me um so yeah there's there's some really cool things going on here this is pretty much a, a straightforward jazz piece introduces some very cool bebop tonality things there uh, toward the end, but for the most part, it's very laid back, jazzy kind of thing going on. It's got a nice bounciness to it, uh, a nice brightness. I love the warmth, the combination in her vocal timbre with uh, the piano. Just it is a very cozy, comfortable uh, sound that I could listen to forever, regardless of the complexity of the music. It is just um, an atmosphere that I can melt into. Uh, we did, uh, no, I don't, uh, I don't remember anymore. 
t- time time in in history has lost all meaning to me. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just it's a very comfortable sound to me. It's very cozy. I I can put this on and just sit next to a window. Could be bright out. Could be raining. Could be snowing. Whatever, and it's just it it'll melt. It I can melt into it. It's just I love it. <clears throat> this is definitely right up my alley. This is my cup of tea right here. Uh, interestingly though, I'm not quite sure how it fits into the theme. Uh, maybe it's because I don't have a lot of experience with, uh, Eastern jazz vocalists. Maybe there is something in that specific realm that makes this vocal unique and stand out amongst the rest. But to me, it's, it's a very comfortable, uh, jazz vocal delivery. I, I don't see anything particularly unique or interesting about it. Um, yeah, like I said, just really good placement, really good warmth. It's a, don't get me wrong, it is a fantastic vocal performance. I don't want to take that away. Um, I just don't see anything here that really elevates it to, uh, a next level where I would say that this is easily definable for me. However, as I've mentioned before, uh, you know, this is my first listen to this uh, vo- to this voice, it's very possible this might have just not been the right song, or uh, maybe there's some nuance in there that I missed while I was also listening to the music. Uh, you know, all of that is possible. Uh, I I made a call on Wednesday, oh Tuesday, with Ishan. I said that his harshes reminded me of Marilyn Manson, and. I went back and actually listened to some Manson and compared it, and it was more that my memory of Manson's harshes reminded me of Ishan's harshes, not so much that they were uh, very closely, re- uh, you know, very similar. Um, so, you know, I, I'm prone to making human errors too. Uh, and, you know, like I said, there's a chance that maybe there's just some nuance I'm missing here, maybe some context that would help me uh, you know, see some of the more unique elements in this vocal delivery. But on a first listen, I'm not sure it fits the theme. However, I'm kind of glad I got picked anyways, because I I adore this. Like I said, this is my kind of music. I can just turn this on and chill and call and, you know, get into a relaxed mode, calm down. It is, uh, it is just very, this is, this is tea time music for me. <laughs> get some chamomile tea, sit down and just put this album on and just, mmm, that's good stuff. Uh, so let's get into some of the music things going on here. Uh, the song kind of separates into, into two parts. I would say we have the more straightforward jazz elements. It's kind of swingy. Uh, and we Interestingly, there are several sections that have very minimal chord progression to them. Uh, one section, I think she even repeated a riff without changing uh, any distance. She just, you know, played the same exact riff note for note repeatedly for quite a few bars. It's very reminiscent of uh, rock and metal that tends to do this. It is a neat little tool to put into music to provide contrast, um, at least in this essence. A lot of the song does utilize chord progressions. And when you don't progress the chord, it instantly stands out. My brain went right to that. I said, the piano's not going anywhere. What's going on? It was an odd part. Uh, And, you know, I've said before, anytime people write music, it's all about taking tools from the toolbox and how you use them. There is no tool that is right or wrong. you got to pick the right one for the situation that you're trying to work within or the sound that you're trying to make. Um, So... But regardless of that, there are definitely tropes that appear across genres. And I just thought it was really interesting to hear something that's not so prevalent in jazz, but is very prevalent in rock and metal, showing up in this extremely jazzy song, even if it was just for a momentary uh, use. Uh, it just It caught me off guard. I thought that was really cool. Um, yeah, so we have this section. I don't know if there's much I can say about it. It's... Uh, follows some really nice chord progressions. It moves in and out of like really calm harmony and introducing a little bit of dissonance every once in a while so that we can have these really strong resolutions. Uh, just really nice uh, singing 
her melodic pattern and the counterpoint between her vocals and the piano lines. Uh, just really gorgeous. I do want to talk about that really interesting decision she makes. She has these very nice, thoughtful, uh, well-spaced out vocal melodies. And they're, they're you know, these little pockets of uh, notes where she might hold out a few notes and then she has rests and then she'll go to the next uh, sentence maybe. But every once in a while she'll go into this idea of these eighth note runs and they're very interesting at least to me because they seem to have a different cadence. I don't understand the language so I don't know how close or how far they are to the traditional speaking cadence of the language but to me, the cadence shifts from her singing cadence to this uh, this very rhythmic one. Uh, and it seems to accent based on rhythm rather than the syllables themselves to create specific rhythms that play against what's going on in the piano. Uh, and not only do we get some really neat rhythmic layering here, but we also get a strong change up in the vocal delivery. The, well, I, sh I should say the lyrical delivery. Uh, again, I don't know how that works against the language, but it is interesting to hear this change up. Um, and it also creates contrast between what comes around it. We have these moments of uh, great flow, I would say, with these really strong lines separated by moments of pause. Uh, and then we run into this section, which is just constant eighth notes. And I love how it also shows off a bit of her range. I wouldn't say she goes way high, but she does come down a bit lower than I was expecting the first time. Uh, and I am kind of interested how far her range is as a vocalist um, and if she can go any lower. Uh, she definitely seems to be singing in a comfortable range, so I would say that there she probably does have a bit on the higher and lower end compared to what she displayed here. But it is, uh, like I said, it is really cool that she went a bit outside of the range that I was expecting and, and uh, hit some lower tones than I was, uh, than I would have guessed. I worked them in into such a natural way. Uh, sometimes uh, I forget how easy it is to play around with, uh, this might be the wrong, I was going to say how easy it is to play around with range in jazz, but I don't know if that's necessarily true. It's just jazz tends to lean again or lean on wider ranges uh, in melody as a as a melody writing tool. So yeah, I don't know if it's easier. I think that might be the wrong word. It's just it's just that it, people tend to write it, so it's easier to fall into the, the trope or the trapping of writing wider ranges in, in the melody. Um, after this section, though, we enter this next part, and it is, it totally caught me off guard. I thought we were going to have this nice, chill, sort of laid-back idea all throughout, and it gets introduced with, <laughs> with a vocal layering. Um, pretty much up until the middle point, it sounded like one vocalist. I'm sure it was double-tracked to add width and whatever. Uh, that's just standard recording practice these days. Or maybe all days. I don't know. I still have a lot of production to learn. <laughs> um, but there was there's a there's an overlap where one vocal line was fading out and the other one was coming in and they overlapped on each other. And I was okay, okay. You know, this is new, but we have a we have a showcase of multiple recording sessions now. And then they started to overlap in greater frequency, and then the piano started to to play around with a lot of tonality, digging into some dissonance. Uh, it almost sounded like they went completely chromatic at one point. Uh, basically, chromatic is when you play with every note on the keyboard. You don't let the you don't let a specific key dictate what notes are going to be played. Every note is available, um, and I say keyboard, but I mean any instrument. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, on a keyboard, it'd be every key. If so the, for the pianist, it'd be every key. So instead of worrying whether you should be playing an E or an E flat in this key, both are viable notes to play. Uh, not usually simultaneously, because that's going to introduce a lot of dissonance. But if you move up 
You know, you have a run that goes up and then comes back down. You might hit the E going up and E flat coming down. Uh, so chromatic creates this idea of atonality where there isn't a set key and it feels kind of uh, directionless, I think would be a good way to put it, um, and chaotic. Because whereas, uh, you know, I've used the, the idea of spices, playing notes outside of the key to add a little bit of spice. Um, you can see the soup and you add in some spice, right? The spice works into the soup to give it a specific flavor. This would be a bowl of spices. <laughs> There's no soup. It's just spice everywhere. <laughs> um, so that makes it sound bad. Chromatic is not bad, but it's definitely a tool that's difficult to work within and it creates a specific atmosphere like right here, a bit of directionless, directionlessness, a bit of chaos, and you really have to know what you're doing with it and how you want to utilize it. And I think this is a perfect example of that where they worked within some of the constraints that they had already set up. It's not like it sounds extremely dissonant. We aren't getting into this avant-garde noise jazz stuff. Um, but we are playing around with a lot more tonality things than we were previously. And they really choose when they want to be a bit more chromatic and atonal and when they want to work within some of the uh, constraints that they've already set up to create this pocket of sound that has just the right amount of chaos uh, and directionlessness added to it without the song sounding like it fell apart completely. It's a, a very fine line to walk. I think they nailed it. And I really like the idea of going into this section with, uh, you know, easing into it with the overlapping vocals, showing that something isn't quite right. Uh, and we're starting to see a little bit of what we thought was the core aspect of the song beginning to fall away and crumble before bringing it all back together to finish out the song. I'm not quite sure how it all works together thematically. I'm not sure what the point uh, of the song is narratively. There's lyrics uh, in another language, so I, I have a language barrier there. It's called neutral, which I think is interesting that it moves from this uh, positive brightness, cohesive element into sort of a dissonant, uh, chaotic one, and then back. Um, so we are seeing both sides. I don't think we ever reach a neutral point, but we see both sides of the spectrum, uh, which I guess could be seen as a type of neutrality. Um, but I absolutely love the story I got out of it, the journey I was taken on listening to this, uh, the evolution into the chaos and the restoration back to the uh, the cohesiveness is done very well. And I think... Oh man, it's just so good. It, it's like swing turning into bebop for a second. And that is just a beautiful, beautiful thing to do. And like I said, the way they did it was very seamless and smooth. Uh, just master craft, master class <laughs> in the craft of uh, introducing uh, dissonance and chaos into a song. And then of course, like I said, just everybody's playing is on point. Like I said, I don't know if this is two people or one person, but the vocals just fit so, the timbre of the vocals fit so well uh, with the piano choice that they have. Uh, it's all, it's just gorgeous. Melody writing's great. Counterpoint's great. It's all done very well. This is where you guys come in, though. Hit me up with your thoughts. Uh, you can comment whether you enjoyed this or not, anything that might have stuck out to you that I didn't touch on or anything that you think needs to be, uh, you know, touched upon more, anything that I talked about that you think I just didn't, uh, you know, pull out all the information necessary. Maybe you heard something else about it. Yeah, go ahead and put those comments down there. I read all of the comments and reply to anything that I think I have an additive thing uh, to talk about. Uh, above the comment section, there is a description box and there is a link for Linktree. It'll take you to this menu right here and from it you can access everything related to the channel. You can access the Discord community, support me through Patreon, follow me on Twitter, shoot me an email, whatever you want to do. Above that, if you could, like, subscribe, and ring the bell. All three things help out the channel immensely. I'll be back uh, in 10 minutes. We're going to have our uh, creator request for the day. We're looking at a group called Autumn's Silence. They are a melodic black metal group, uh, self-described. 
Uh, and actually, they also have symphonic in here. Symphonic melodic black metal. Uh, well, okay, so this single is going to be symphonic black metal, but overall they, they classify themselves as melodic black metal. If you're interested in that, a new upcoming black metal group, go ahead and uh, stick around for that one. It's going to be pretty interesting, I think. Otherwise, I'll be back on Monday at uh, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 10 p.m. UTC as usual with our 100th week of, uh, of music. It's, uh, it's been a journey, <laughs> that's for sure. Uh, and, uh, you know, as I mentioned in the channel update last week, moving into year three, we got lots of big plans. So I'm excited about what's to come. This is a major milestone. We hit the third year. We're going to hit 20,000 subscribers next month. Uh, we hit our 100th week of doing reactions. A lot of milestones right here, and, and I'm so excited about what's to come. Thank you, everybody, for helping me get to this point. I've kind of turned this outro into a, a bit of a, I don't know, something else. So let's wrap this one up. Uh, until next time, remember to be critical but not cynical of the music you listen to. And have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening whenever you choose to watch my videos.